This is Space Time, Series 22, Episode 53, coming up on Space Time. Man on the Moon, the Apollo 11 mission celebrates half a century. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. It's arguably the greatest scientific achievement of mankind. It was 50 years ago this week, on July the 20th, 1969, that humans set foot on the surface of another world for the first time. The historic success of the Apollo 11 moon mission and its crew of Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins was the culmination of the incredible efforts of thousands of scientists and engineers from across the United States and around the world. Of course, it was a Cold War military campaign for the ultimate high ground. But it was also a technological struggle to develop the expertise, materials and systems needed to venture to a strange new world. And it was very much a political demonstration of the superiority of the West, some would say America, democracy and capitalism over the totalitarian regimes of communism in the Soviet Union. But while it's easy to bask in glory and success now, it wasn't always that way. In fact, the space race started out very differently. It actually began with the rise of the ultimate evil in Europe, in the form of Nazi Germany, and their vengeance weapon, the V2A4 rocket, the first man-made object to reach space. Built on the tortured backs of forced labourers and wretched concentration camp prisoners, more than 12,000 of whom died during its development, the two-ton liquid fueled V-2 rocket was the world's first long-range ballistic missile. Equipped with gyroscopic guidance systems and rudders and jet control, the V-2 would launch vertically to an altitude of about 10 kilometres, then proceed on an arc course, eventually hitting its target at a speed of almost 6,500 kilometres per hour. Over 5,200 V-2s were built, most targeted London, Antwerp and Liege. Those attacks killed more than 9,000 mostly civilians. In a last desperate attempt to escape defeat, German science threw everything it had into the perfection of V-2. Hurtling through the stratosphere at 3,000 miles an hour to fall on London, this was the peak of 15 years of German scientific research. Second only to the atom bomb, V-2 was the war's deadliest weapon. The man behind the V-2 was a proud Nazi named Werner von Braun. He was happy to turn a blind eye to the death and torture his vengeance weapons produced. But not all his V-2s caused death and destruction. On June the 20th, 1944, V-2 rocket MW-18014 was launched from Pennymunda on Germany's Baltic coast on a vertical trajectory, becoming the first man-made object to reach an altitude of over 100 kilometres, the Kármán line, marking the official start of space. Following the defeat of the Nazis during World War II, American, British and Soviet governments all gained access to parts of V-2 technology and some of the rockets themselves, as well as the Nazi scientists responsible for creating them. America got Werner von Braun through Operation Paperclip. The Soviet Union used their captured V-2s to develop the famous R-7 family of rockets. They were the world's first intercontinental ballistic missiles, specifically designed to launch nuclear weapons against the West. But they became far better known for their alternative job as Sputnik, Vostok, Voskhod and Soyuz orbital launch vehicles. And that was hammered home for the whole world on October the 4th, 1957, when Sputnik was launched from the Baikonur Cosmodrome, carrying the world's first orbital satellite, Sputnik 1, into space. The tiny 58-centimetre diameter spherical satellite, travelling at some 29,000 kilometres per hour, circled the Earth every 90 minutes, transmitting its now iconic beep-beep-beep radio signal, reminding the United States and its Western allies of the technical superiority of the Soviet Union. It's a report from man's farthest frontier, the radio signal transmitted by the Soviet Sputnik, the first man-made satellite as it passed over New York earlier today. The main Soviet papers today devote more than half their space to the satellite with front page banner headlines such as rarely seen in this country. There are precious few scientific details being divulged. The headlines are about glorious victory of Soviet science. Today, a new moon is in the sky, a 23-inch metal sphere placed in orbit by a Russian rocket. The reaction 
reaction was one of astonishment and concern, for it was now known that a potential enemy was at least temporarily ahead in developing means for space travel. President Eisenhower reassures the nation that Russia's success with the first satellite does not indicate a serious lag in American rocket research. The morning of November 8, 1957, at Huntsville, Alabama. A sudden meeting has been called by General John B. Medeiros, commanding general of the Army Ballistic Missile Agency. Of course, the Americans were also developing ballistic missiles based on V-2 technology. And thanks to Operation Paperclip, they had the boss of the V-2 program, Werner von Braun. Von Braun was behind the project to develop the U.S. Army's Redstone rocket. It was developed as a surface-to-surface missile and for suborbital flights. Meanwhile, the U.S. Navy was developing their own launch vehicle under Project Vanguard, specially designed to lift satellites into orbit. Vanguard wasn't blemished by the bloody stain of von Braun, and so Washington signaled it for the first American orbital mission. Sadly, however, it failed during liftoff, exploding on the Cape Canaveral launch pad on December 6, 1957, after reaching a height of less than two metres. A great wave of advanced publicity focused attention at Cape Canaveral, Florida, for the launching of Test Vehicle 3 of Project Vanguard. America's first attempt to launch a satellite, a six and a half inch sphere weighing just over three pounds, another setback for the United States in the race into outer space, a loss of thrust and fall back to Earth in split seconds. Following the Navy's failure, the US Army was quick to step up, using a redstone derivative known as the Juno-1 to successfully launch America's first satellite Explorer-1 into orbit on January the 31st, 1958. At Cape Canaveral, Florida, the Army's Jupiter-C rocket is ready for America's second attempt to launch a space satellite. The hours long countdown approaches zero. A moment of enormous tension, for every missile launching is still an experiment. Any one of tens of thousands of things can go wrong, with catastrophic results. But all that can be done to assure perfection has been done. The moment is at hand, the countdown reaches zero. Some three minutes later, Explorer is in orbit. Broadcasting to the world its coded scientific data. Cosmic ray intensity, meteor impact, solar radiation. These are the dry facts that will help carry man ever farther into the age of space. Then, on April the 12th, 1961, Moscow cemented its space prowess with the launch of Vostok 1, the world's first manned space flight. Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin orbited the Earth just once, skimming the upper atmosphere at an altitude of 169 kilometres. The flight took 108 minutes from launch to landing, but Gagarin wasn't in the capsule when it landed. He parachuted out separately, ejecting from the capsule at 7 kilometres or 23,000 feet. All Russia's just wild about Yuri Gagarin, first man to conquer space. Modest, just a family man. It was no secret, either in Moscow or anywhere else, that Russia was ready to make the attempt. At 7 minutes past 7 a.m. our time, the 450-ton rocket went up. Gagarin was in radio contact with the ground. In his four-and-a-half-ton nose cone, he orbited once and was back again 108 minutes after takeoff. Moscow prepared to give Major Gagarin a hero's welcome. Mr. Khrushchev interrupted his Black Sea holiday to be present. He gave Russia a toast to the man who has won immortal fame, the conqueror of space, cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin. So for the US it was a case of playing catch-up, and that was achieved a month later on May the 5th, 1961, when Alan Shepard became the first American in space, flying in a Mercury capsule attached to a Redstone rocket. But the Redstone would never be powerful enough to send a Mercury capsule into orbit, so Shepard's flight was designed as a short 15-minute suborbital ballistic trajectory, straight up and straight back down again. All right, uh, lift off and the clock is starting. Yes, sir, reading you loud and clear. This is Freedom 7. The fuel is go 1.2 G. Cabin at 14 PSI. Oxygen is go. How's the rhythm good? This is 7. Fuel is go. Cabin pressure is holding at 5.5. That's understand. 
Nine, cabin holding at 5-5. Five, five. Oxygen is go. The main bus is 24. And the isolated battery is 29. Well, it's read you five to five. Protect the road, okay. Okay, it's a lot smoother now. A lot smoother. Gotcha. All systems are go. That's all systems go. Protect the road, okay. 5G. Just a few weeks after Shepard's flight, US President John F. Kennedy announced his intent to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade and safely return him to the Earth again. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space. And none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. But it wasn't until almost a year later that the US Air Force's larger, more powerful Atlas rocket was finally ready to launch a Mercury capsule into an orbital trajectory. And on February the 20th, 1962, John Glenn became the first American to orbit the Earth, circling the planet three times. America had finally caught up with the Soviet Union. Three engines start. You hear the wee ones be with you, Farmer. Good Lord, ride all the way. If God speed, John Glenn. Ten, nine, eight. While Project Mercury was designed to simply put a man safely into orbit, Project Gemini was designed to test the technologies needed to get a man to the moon. The larger two-man Gemini capsule also required a larger rocket, and the US Air Force's Titan intercontinental ballistic missile was chosen for the job. A new space team for the moon shoot. These are the astronauts who will orbit in the Gemini, and it is hoped to land on the moon in the Apollo spacecraft. The Gemini, an intermediate spacecraft between the familiar Mercury and the Apollo mooncraft, carrying two men. It's hard to realize that the Wright brothers made their first flight just 58 years ago. Gemini performed missions which were long enough for a trip to the moon and back. It pioneered the orbital maneuvers necessary to achieve rendezvous in space and carried out the first space dockings. Gemini was also slated to undertake the first EVAs or extravehicular activities, as NASA speak for spacewalk, needed to work outside a spacecraft. But once again they were beaten to the punch by the Soviets. On March the 18th, 1965, Soviet cosmonaut Alexei Leonov undertook the world's first ever spacewalk, spending 12 minutes outside the relative safety of his Voskhod 2 capsule. But the EVA was not without incident. His spacesuit ballooned from its internal pressure against the vacuum of space, stiffening so much he almost failed to be able to get back inside the capsule through its inflatable cloth airlock. It would be four years before the Soviets undertook another spacewalk. Meanwhile, on June 3rd, 1965, Ed White performed the first American spacewalk, spending 21 minutes outside his Gemini 4 capsule. White was tethered to the spacecraft with his oxygen supplied through a 7.6 metre umbilical which also carried communications and biomedical instrumentation. And unlike Leonov, he was able to control his motion in space using a handheld manoeuvring unit. Okay, I'm separating from the spacecraft. Okay, separating from the spacecraft at this time. Right. Okay, my feet are out. I think I'm dragging a little bit so I don't want to fire the gun yet. Okay, I'm out. Okay, I put a little roll in, took it right out. Am I in your view, Jimbo? Yeah, you know, I can't... Don't sweat it. I'll come over to you. Okay, I rolled off. I'm rolling to the right now. It's under my own influence. Now, I've come above the space trap. I'm coming back down now. I'm under my own control. While Gemini could theoretically be used to get astronauts to the moon and back, it was left to the mighty 111-metre-tall Saturn V rocket and its Apollo command, service and lunar modules to ultimately achieve that historic goal. The massive Saturn V remains the largest rocket ever built, it could carry 140 tons into low Earth orbit and 48.6 tons into translunar orbit. But Apollo almost ended before it began, with a tragic launch pad fire that killed the crew of Apollo 1 during a pre-flight test in 1967. The disaster put on hold all American manned spaceflight operations until the cause was identified and a fix applied. The inquiry found faulty electrical wiring had shorted out in the 100% pure oxygen atmosphere inside the command module. 
The problem was made worse because of the design of the capsule's hatch, which prevented easy emergency escape. Meanwhile, the Soviet Union had its own problems with its man-moon mission. While Moscow kept denying that it was participating in a race to the moon, it secretly pursued its own lunar program throughout the 1960s and early 70s. Moscow's plans included a series of manned lunar flyby missions using a Soyuz Zond capsule launched aboard a Proton K rocket. The Soyuz Zond capsule would later be joined by a new Soviet lunar lander called the LK lander craft. The pair launched together aboard the Soviets' own new moon rocket, the 105-metre tall N1. Like the Saturn V, the N1 was a massive rocket, but very different in its design. It used five stages, including a 30-engine first stage, and that was part of its Achilles heel, getting all those rocket engines to fire correctly. The N1 was designed to carry 95 tonnes to low Earth orbit and 23.5 tonnes to lunar transfer orbit. However, there were ongoing problems with the development of the N1 launch vehicle, and they were compounded following the death in 1966 of Soviet rocket genius Sergei Korolev. The problems with the N1 didn't go away and in fact were amplified by a series of catastrophic and spectacular failures which eventually saw the program terminated in 1974. Across the Atlantic and following the disaster of Apollo 1, a series of unmanned test flights were carried out using Saturn 1, Saturn 1B and Saturn 5 rockets in various configurations, some of which also included Apollo capsules. The first manned mission was Apollo 7 in October 1968, an 11-day test flight in low Earth orbit. Delays in developing the Apollo lunar module saw Apollo 8's December 1968 mission change from one of testing the lunar module in low Earth orbit to an historic first manned journey to the moon. It was during Apollo 8's journey around the moon that on Christmas Eve 1968, the crew gave a memorable reading from the book of Genesis. We are now approaching uh, lunar sunrise, and uh, for all the people back on Earth, the crew of Apollo 8, has a message that we would like to send to you. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. And from the crew of Apollo 8, we close with good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on the good earth. They also photographed what would turn out to be one of the most important and significant images ever taken. Simply called Earthrise, it showed the pale blue-white marble of Earth slowly rising above the grey desolation of the lunar horizon. The lunar module finally got its maiden test flight in March 1969 aboard Apollo 9. The crew spent six hours testing the lunar module, as well as the spacesuits astronauts would eventually wear on the lunar surface. Just two months later, in May 1969, we saw the launch of Apollo 10, undertaking a full dress rehearsal for a lunar landing mission, taking the lunar module to within 15 kilometers or 50,000 feet of the moon's surface. By this time, American spy planes and satellites had worked out that the Soviet N-1 rocket had crashed and burned, and Moscow's plans to beat the Americans to the moon lay in ashes. And so it was with a clear road ahead that Apollo 11 launched aboard its Saturn V rocket on July the 16th, 1969 from Space Launch Complex 39A at the Kennedy Space Center at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida. Four minutes and counting. We are go for Apollo 11. We'll be coming up in the automatic sequence about to 10 or 15 seconds from this time. The vehicle starting to pressurize as far as the propellant tanks are concerned and all is still go as we monitor our status for it. 
Firing command coming in now. They're on an automatic sequence as the master computer supervises hundreds of events occurring over these last few minutes. Two minutes, ten seconds, and counting. Oxidizer tanks in the second and third stages now have pressurized. T minus one minute, 35 seconds. The third stage completely pressurized. 40 seconds away from the Apollo 11 liftoff. All the second stage tanks now pressurized. 35 seconds and counting. We are still go with Apollo 11. 30 seconds and counting. Astronauts report it feels good. T minus 25 seconds. 20 seconds and counting. T minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence starts. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Right on schedule, main engine cutout, or Miko, occurred two minutes and 42 seconds into the flight, followed by first stage separation and second stage ignition. Seco, or second stage engine cutout and stage separation, took place 9 minutes and 8 seconds after launch, and that was followed by third stage ignition, placing Apollo 11 into a 186 kilometer high low Earth orbit. After one and a half orbits of the Earth, the Saturn V third stage engine was fired up again, accelerating Apollo 11 into a translunar injection flight path. The crew then undocked their command and service module, which had been named Columbia, from the third stage, turned it around, and docked it with the lunar module mounted in the third stage payload compartment. After safely extracting the lunar module, codenamed Eagle, from its spent third stage, Apollo 11 continued on its 400,000-kilometer journey to the moon. Apollo 11 arrived at the moon on July the 19th, firing its engine to slow down and place itself into a lunar orbit. The next day, July 20, 1969, Armstrong and Aldrin undocked their lunar module, leaving Collins alone in Columbia, and began their historic descent down to the lunar surface. But things didn't go smoothly. As the descent began, Armstrong and Aldrin found themselves passing landmarks on the surface two to three seconds earlier than expected, Armstrong reporting that they were long and would end up landing kilometres west of their target point. Then, all of a sudden, five minutes into the descent, some 1.8 kilometres or 6,000 feet above the surface of the moon, the lunar module's guidance computer suddenly began distracting the crew with multiple unexpected 12.01 and 12.02 program alarms. Uh, Houston, I'm getting a little fluctuation in the uh, AV uh, voltage now. Roger. Just the uh, meter, maybe, huh? Stand by. Looking good to us. You're still looking good. It's three, coming up three minutes. Anything? That's real good. To con you go to continue power descent. You're a go to continue power descent. And Eagle Houston, we got data dropouts. You're still looking good. Program alarm. Look for 1202. 1202. Good radar data. Altitude now 33,500 feet. Give us a reading on the 1202 program alarm. Roger, we got you. We're going at alarm. Roger. We're still go. Altitude 27,000 feet. Same alarm, and it appears to come up when we have a 1668 up. Roger. Copy. Eagle Houston, we'll monitor That's your Delta H. Beautifully. Delta H is looking good to us. Altitude now 21,000 feet. Still looking very good. Velocity down now to 1,200 feet per second. You're looking great to us, Eagle. Okay, I'm still on flu, uh, so we may tend to lose as we gradually pitch over. Let me try auto again now, see what happens. Roger. Okay, looks like it's holding. Roger, we got good data. We now know this simply meant the computer couldn't complete all its tasks in real time and had to postpone some of them. But at the time, people weren't sure what it meant, and there was a very real risk that mission managers were about to abort the flight. The problem was eventually diagnosed to the rendezvous radar switch being in the wrong position causing Eagle's onboard computer to process data from both the rendezvous and landing radars at the same time. With that issue resolved, Armstrong saw his landing site. Now, remember, they were off target, and the place they would have come down in was in the middle of an area strewn with boulders and near a deep crater. With propellant running low, Armstrong took over, piloting the lunar module towards a clear area away from the boulders. But just as he was preparing to land, just 30 metres above the ground, they suddenly saw another crater, forcing them to move even further to find a clear patch to touch down. 60 seconds. Lights on, down two and a half, picking up some dust. City feet, two and a half down, straight shadow, four forward, drifting to the right a little. Down and a half. 30 seconds. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. ACA at a descent. Boat control, both auto descent, engine command override off. Engine arm off. 413 is in. We copy you down, Eagle. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. 
Roger, twang, tranquility. We copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. Armstrong and Aldrin had performed the first landing on the surface of another world, touching down on the Sea of Tranquility at 2017 and 40 seconds Greenwich Mean Time on July 20th, 1969. The schedule then called for the astronauts to follow their landing with a five-hour sleep period. Aldrin, who was an elder with the Webster Presbyterian Church, took Holy Communion. But instead of resting afterwards, the pair chose to begin their preparations for the EVA early, thinking they would be unable to sleep anyway. But the preparations took longer than expected, meaning they were pretty well back on time when the lunar module's hatch opened at 2.39 and 33 seconds GMT. Armstrong then began descending the ladder, deploying a television camera along the way to broadcast the historic event live. Neil, this is Houston, loud and clear. Break, break, buzz, this is Houston. Uh, radio check and verify TV circuit breaker in. Roger, TV circuit breaker's in. Page 5, clear. Roger. And we're getting a picture on the TV. So we got a good picture, huh? Uh, there's a great deal of contrast in it, and it's... Uh, Currently, it's upside down on our monitor, but we can make out a fair amount of detail. The television signal was received by NASA's Deep Space Communications Network at Goldstone, California in the United States. But with better fidelity by this time at the Honeysuckle Creek tracking station near Canberra in Australia, the signal was switched. And minutes later, the signal was switched to the more sensitive Parkes Radio Telescope, also in Australia. Despite some technical and weather difficulties, ghostly black and white images of the first ever lunar EVA were received and broadcast to at least 600 million people on Earth. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. Okay, I just checked, uh, getting back up to that first step. Uh, it's uh, not even collapsed too far, but uh, it's adequate to get back up. Roger, we copy That's a pretty good little jump. While still on the ladder, Armstrong uncovered a plaque mounted on the lunar descent stage, bearing two drawings showing Earth's western and eastern hemispheres, together with the inscription, Here, men from the planet Earth first set foot on the moon, July 1969 AD. We came in peace for all mankind. I'm uh, at the foot of the ladder. The lamb footbeds are only uh, uh, depressed in the surface about uh, one or two inches. Uh, although the surface appears to be uh, very, very fine-grained as you get close to it. It's almost like a powder. Ground mass uh, is very fine. Then, at 0256 and 15 seconds Greenwich Mean Time, six and a half hours after landing, Armstrong stepped off the Eagle's foot pad. I'm going to step off the land now. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Yes, the uh, surface is fine and powdery. I can, I can pick it up loosely with my toe. It does adhere to, in fine layers, uh, like uh, powdered charcoal, to the uh, to the sole and, and sides of my boot. I only go in a uh, small fraction of an inch, maybe an eighth of an inch, but I can see the footprints of my uh, boots and the treads and the fine sandy particles. Neil, this is Houston. We're copying. After inspecting and then describing his surroundings, Armstrong grabbed some soil samples and began his historic first ever spacewalk on the moon. There seems to be no difficulty in moving around as, as we suspected. Uh, it's even perhaps easier than the simulations of 1-6G that uh, we performed uh, in various simulations on the ground. Absolutely no trouble to uh, walk around. Okay, the uh, Ethan engine did not leave a crater of any size. It uh, has about one foot clearance on the ground. We're uh, essentially on a very level place here. Uh, I can see uh, some evidence of, uh, of rays emanating from the descent engine, but uh, very insignificant amount. Okay, but are we ready to uh, bring down the camera? I'm all ready. I think it's... Uh... Two miles squared away in good shape. Okay. Looks like you'll have to pay out all the LEC, Ned. Looks like it's coming out nice and evenly. A short time later, Buzz Aldrin followed Armstrong onto the lunar surface. You're on. You've got three more steps and then a long one. Okay, I'm going to leave that one foot up there and both hands down about the fourth rung up. There you go. Okay, you now I think I'll do the same. A little more. Not another inch. There you got it. That's a good step. Yeah, about a three-footer. Beautiful view. Isn't that something? Magnificent flight out here. Magnificent desolation. 
They then unfurled the flag of the United States of America, mounted on a special pole, explored the surface taking photographs, collected a total of 21.5 kilograms of lunar material samples, and deployed numerous automated scientific instruments, while continuously sending black and white television images back to Earth. The scientific payload included a passive seismic experiment package to measure moonquakes and a retroreflector for lunar laser ranging experiments. Two main types of rocks were found in the geological samples collected by the pair, basalts and breccia. They discovered three new mineral types in the rock samples. These would eventually be named pyroxferite, tranquillitite, which was named after their location in the Sea of Tranquility, and amalcolite, named after Armstrong, Audrin and Collins. All three minerals have subsequently been found on Earth. The material collected included large amounts of glass formed when meteorites struck the lunar surface. Some of this glass was formed more than 4 billion years ago, preserved by the lack of water and atmosphere on the lunar surface, giving scientists some of their first insights into the early days of the solar system. The discovery of a rock called anorthrosite showed that the moon had once been the site of very complex geological processes and not always the magnificent desolation Aldrin had described. Perhaps the most important findings came from comparing similarities in the composition of lunar and earth rocks, and then noting differences in the amount of specific substances. Ultimately, this led to the confirmation of the Big Impact Theory, namely that the moon formed from debris blown off the earth by a collision between the earth and a Mars-sized object which we now call Thea some 4.5 billion years ago. Armstrong and Aldrin spent a total of 21 hours 36 minutes on the lunar surface, including 2 hours 31 minutes outside the spacecraft. The astronauts then returned safely to Earth on July the 24th, 1969, ending the most historic journey in human history. Following Apollo 11, six more missions were sent to the lunar surface. Apollo 12 flew in November 1969, landing in the Sea of Storms. Apollo 13 became almost as famous as Apollo 11 after an explosion crippled the ship. During their April 1970 flight, a switch and insulation, which should have been modified during an upgrade to an oxygen tank, were damaged during a test of that tank during construction. When the associated heater was turned on during the flight, the tank exploded, depleting almost all power from the command module and forcing the crew to use the lunar module as a lifeboat. The crew improvised emergency fixes with what they had on board and made it safely back home. Apollo 14 was launched at the end of January 1971, landing in the Fra Mauro region, the crew spending more than nine hours outside the lunar module, setting up numerous experiments. In July 71, the crew of Apollo 15 became the first to drive a car on the moon. They had taken with them a small, lightweight lunar rover. The buggy allowed the astronauts to travel more than 27 kilometres across Hadley Rail, collecting samples and exploring new sites. Apollo 16 flew in April 1972, landing in the challenging Tecates Highlands. The flight of Apollo 17 in December 1972 turned out being the last manned mission to the moon. It landed in the Taurus Luthero region and included the most extensive of all lunar exploration programs. There were three moonwalks, each lasting more than seven hours, the crew staying on the moon for over three days. The final three missions, Apollos 18, 19 and 20, were all axed to redirect funds to NASA's Skylab and Space Shuttle programs. While the Apollo lunar flights ended in 1972, the knowledge they brought science is still being applied and used today. In fact, NASA receives about 60 research requests for lunar samples each year, resulting in some 525 samples being analysed annually. In fact, one survey shows almost 3,000 scientific papers have now been published using Apollo data. And of course, the Apollo legacy goes well beyond science. Apollo not only fulfilled Kennedy's goal of landing a man back on the moon before the end of the decade, it ultimately achieved his diplomatic goal of the Cold War rivals working together. In 1975, the Apollo-Soyuz test project saw the last Apollo spacecraft dock with a Soviet Soyuz capsule, with their two crews conducting joint operations in orbit. Of course, that's a legacy which continues today, with the United States, Russia and 16 other countries all working together aboard the International Space Station. And of course, America, with the help of Europe, is now planning a return of humans to the moon by 2024 under Project Artemis. While the media and politicians seem to have short attention spans when it comes to space and missions to the moon, people generally remain fascinated. And that was demonstrated earlier this year when the documentary film Apollo 11 won the Documentary Special Jury Award for editing at the Sundance Film Festival. 
The movie was crafted from a newly discovered, never-before-seen trove of 70mm footage and more than 11,000 hours of uncatalogued audio recordings. The footage is so pristine and the find so significant that the projects now evolved beyond filmmaking into one of film curation and historic preservation. It's being released at theatres on July 18, providing audiences with what will be a vivid experience of those momentous events. Stephen Slater was the film's archival producer. The 70 mil actually came when we were about four months into the project. We just had an, an email from the head of the motion picture division at the National Archives in Maryland, which is in the US, which is the end repository for any film sort of shot by the US government. And it just said, hey, by the way, we've, we've just um, we found 165 reels of 70 millimeter film. About a third of it is related to Apollo 11. Do you, could this, this might change the direction of your, your project. But <laughs> it was too stunned yes. to get that email. <laughs> <laughs> but but until that point, I had this sort of crusade to try and particularly add sound to all the silent 16 millimeter film. So this was all the stuff that was shot in Mission Control. It was kind of shot as B-roll, really, yep. by NASA cameramen. They were just on-offing these cameras. The film would then be processed and spliced together with lots of other reels shot in Mission Control. And so it was just all randomly assembled. And I'd always seen some of this film used in other documentaries and I wanted to put it in the right order and also work out, you know, I'd see a controller sort of goldfishing and I'd want to know what he was saying. So I took upon this task to try and lip sync all the audio to the controllers, well, particularly the, uh, so sort of certainly in the early days, it was the Capcom guy who's responsible for talking to the astronauts. So I would like find roughly where I thought the film had been shot in the mission and then try out all this all the air around audio to see what fitted. And so, yeah, that was the start of assembly this stuff and trying to get it into a timeline and we carried that on throughout the film in parallel with the discovery of the 70 mil material so a huge jigsaw puzzle and we're you know it's, it's a lot more complete than it was it told a wonderful story yes absolutely uh, it's uh it's unprecedented. I mean, we when we saw that for the first time, particularly the, the, the reels of the astronauts suiting out, that was some of the first stuff I saw. I'm just blown away by by the quality of it. It felt like it was could have been shot yesterday. But you know, all this stuff's very good. But if you if you if you're not telling the story correctly, then it could be wasted. So. Now, I think that particularly Douglas Miller, the director, did an amazing job of making sense out of all this chaos and making it understandable for a lay audience. Was it hard to understand the timeline yourselves, or, or are you space buffs who sort of knew this has happened here and, and that happened there? And Well, we're, we're relying on all kinds of reference points to get... I mean, no one's done this for us. We sort of have the raw material, and then... But there's no, apart from very rudimentary slates, I mean, if you're talking about the Mission Control... So it's all we, all we kind of generally would have would be a date. And the way they shot this stuff tended to be very, very short bursts. So you weren't sure. It wasn't obvious always when around you know, when they started filming, when they stopped filming. So you could have looking at material that was shot over a period of several hours or days. So it was a heck, heck of a task. Very much a fly on the wall watching what's going on. Yeah, and no retrospective interviews with, with, with people coming out with the same old cliché quotes about what it felt like and, and stuff. It just puts you back in the moment. That's Stephen Slater, the archival producer for the movie Apollo 11, which opens in theatres on July 18. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com or from your favourite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C. and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 